Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. I've been asked to cover how to measure the input impedance of a circuit or device. Now, there are two distinct situations which I'm thinking of that I would like to cover. The first is a low frequency amplifier or device such as an audio amplifier. This one is the simplest to do because it most often doesn't really care about complex impedance. The second is where we are concerned with the complex input impedance of the device or circuit. This one gets a bit more difficult. In this video, I'm going to cover the first option, which will reveal the simple input impedance. The next video will cover the second option. So, why can't I just take my DVM probes and stick them in the input connector and measure the input impedance? Well, the reality is the input to the device or circuit is very likely capacitively coupled internally. The DVM uses a DC current to determine ohms which will not get past this capacitor. Thus, we cannot simply use our ohm meter to measure it. We have to use a signal source that will provide a nice sine wave that will get past this capacitor. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. So like any project, the first step is planning what we're going to be doing. The very first step in planning our approach is to know something about the thing we're going to be testing. For this video, I'm going to be testing the input impedance of this Kinter MAI 70 Plus two-channel stereo amplifier. The specifications provided with my amplifier tell me that it is designed around 20 Hz to 20 kHz frequency response. It also tells me that I should expect an input impedance of 47 k ohms. Nice. Unfortunately, it doesn't say anything about input voltage levels. I'm going to have to make an assumption or two here. Now, because it is an audio amplifier, I'm going to assume that it is designed around what is referred to as line level input signal. So, what does line level mean? Well, this gets a bit complicated, but here it goes. As a consumer product, this amplifier is likely expecting an input level of minus 10 dBV. If this were a professional product, then we would be thinking plus 4 dBU. Okay, so there is the whole dBU versus dBV issue that I will briefly unravel. In short, the standard for dBV is 1 volt. So dBV is equal to 20 times the log to the base 10 of the voltage in volts divided by 1 volt. On the other hand, the standard for dBU is 0.775 volts because it produces one milliwatt of power into a 600 ohm load. I know, weird, but this dates back to ancient days and sticks around with us yet today. So dBU is equal to 20 times the log to the base 10 of the voltage in volts divided by 0.775 volts. Now we get to set our test voltage. Well, setting the test voltage is more about determining the maximum voltage we can safely use. As we look at this particular amplifier, this is a consumer product, not a professional one. As such, I'm going to assume that it is expecting minus 10 dBV. Now I have to turn this into a voltage by rearranging the dBV equation. This gives me that voltage is equal to 10 brought to the dBV over 20 power. And if we stick our minus 10 dBV into this, we get a voltage of 0.316 volts. But what kind of volts are we talking about? 
is this volts peak to peak, volts peak, volts RMS. What kind of volts? The answer is that it is volts RMS. That is kind of hard to measure on an oscilloscope. I prefer volts peak to peak for this. It's a lot easier to line up my graticals on the screen that way. So the next step for me is to convert this volts RMS into volts peak to peak. So volts peak to peak is equal to two times the square root of two times the volts in RMS. Thus, the test voltage that we need is two times the square root of two times 0.316 volts, which gives us 0.894 volts peak to peak. Now, I don't have to use that level. I could choose to use a much lower voltage too. Now, we're almost there. We just have a couple more things to think about. Well, there are three more questions to consider. First, does the input impedance change with the volume setting? Well, in some cases, the input is connected directly to the top of the volume potentiometer. The wiper then goes from ground at one end to direct connection to the input at the other end. And this would most definitely affect the input impedances seen from the input. Second, does the input impedance change with the applied input voltage? The dynamics of circuits as they are might mean that the input impedance will shift in one direction or another depending upon our test voltage. And third, does the input impedance change with frequency? Now, we could make the measurements at one frequency and, well, be happy with that, assuming that everything is going to be consistent across the frequency range of the amplifier. Or we could take several measurements across the frequency range, maybe as few as three, you know, the, the bottom and the middle and the top, or maybe as many as you might want to create a nice curve in Excel. Now, with all of our planning complete, it's time to begin the process. Well, now we get to get things set up. First, how do I have my equipment configured? Looking at the signal generator, the frequency is set to 1 kilohertz because, well, this is kind of a standard frequency for audio devices. The output waveform is a sine wave. The output voltage is set to 400 millivolts peak to peak centered around 0 volts. Now remember, we don't have to use the full 894 millivolts for testing. I'm using the 400 millivolts peak to peak which is easily divisible by two. The signal generator's output impedance is set to 50 ohms. So why do I have my signal generator set up for a 50 ohm load and a 50 ohm load attached to it? This is so that the output voltage of the signal generator is virtually unaffected by the load of the amplifier's input. Now, the resistance decade box. It starts out with all of the dials set to zero. Finally, my scope is set for 100 millivolts per division, so I get a nice display of the waveform, and a sweep rate of 500 microseconds per division, which will give me several cycles on the screen. Next, how are things connected? Well, the first thing I'm concerned about is making sure the output of the amplifier is properly loaded. Unfortunately, I do not have any high power 8 ohm loads. I will have to use a pair of properly power rated speakers. The output of the signal generator is connected to a BNCT, which has a 50 ohm load on it to satisfy the signal generator's expectations. The BNCT is connected to my resistance decade box. Now, the other side of the resistance decade box is connected to the input of the scope and to the input of the amplifier. We will be using the scope to monitor the voltage applied to the input of the amplifier. Now you can probably start to see the measurement process coming by now. 
So let's go make our initial measurement. Well, my first concern is if the position of the volume control makes a difference. Why is that? Because I would really like to do all my tests with the volume control turned all the way down so I don't have to listen to it. If it doesn't make a difference, then I can do that. So I will turn the volume control all the way down. Now, we're ready to go. Let's power up the amplifier. I set my scope so that I have the 400 millivolt peak-to-peak -peak signal nicely aligned on my graticals. I increase the resistance of my decade box until the signal in the scope reaches half of the original signal or 200 millivolts peak to peak. The decade box forms the input resistance to a voltage divider. The input impedance of the amplifier forms the output impedance of the same voltage divider. When the voltage is halved, then the resistance of the decade box is equal to the input impedance of the amplifier. So, what do we get here? Well, the decade box reads 91 k ohms. Now, I will turn up the volume control all the way and see if it makes a difference in the voltage I see on the scope. Whoa, man, look at that. Does it ever make a difference? Okay. So I'm going to have to turn the volume control all the way up and repeat my measurement. Now what do I measure? Well, the decade box reads 12.4 k ohms. This means that if I want to completely characterize this amplifier for its input impedance, I have to include the position of the volume control. This is most definitely not going to be a linear change because most every volume control uses a logarithmic taper to their value. Now, why do they do that? That's because the human ear responds in a logarithmic fashion when it comes to the perception of loudness. Thus, it makes sense that a volume control should be a logarithmic entity. Now, I could just stop my testing here if I'm satisfied with the results at one kilohertz. But, being the curious kind of guy that I am, I'd like to see if the input level makes a difference. So the question is, does the input impedance change with signal level? Now, all I'm going to do to accomplish this is to set my input signal to 800 millivolts and repeat the same test, once with the volume control all the way down and once with the volume control all the way up. If the input level makes little to no difference, I can expect to get input impedance measurements reasonably close to when we were using the 400 millivolts as our signal source. So, what do I see? Well, let's start with the volume control all the way down. With the 400 millivolt source, I measured an input impedance of 91 k ohms. With the 800 millivolt source, I measured an input impedance of 89 k ohms. Not a huge difference, it's only about 2%. Okay, so what about with the volume control all the way up? Well, with the 400 millivolt source, I got an input impedance of 12.4 k ohms. With the 800 millivolt source, I got an input impedance of 11.8 k ohms. Again, not a huge difference, only about 4.8%. So, to my relief, there isn't enough of a difference to bother with. But I'm not going to stop there. I'm also interested in how the input impedance changes with frequency. And it will. I'm going to reset my signal source back to 400 millivolts. Now, let's set the frequency to 20 hertz and the volume control all the way down. So with the volume control all the way down and the frequency set to 20 hertz, it comes out that the input impedance is 95 k ohms. But what about the volume control all the way up? Repeating the same test, I discover that the input impedance is 47 k ohms. Now, I will go up to 20 kilohertz and repeat the process. With the volume control all the way down, 
the input impedance comes out to be 27 k ohms. With the volume control all the way up, I get an input impedance of 9.8 k ohms. Now, I've repeated this process at 10 different frequencies across the specified range of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz so that I could get a better idea about how the input impedance changes with frequency. As you can see in this chart, the input impedance is in no way a constant and only agrees with the specification sheet in two places. At 20 hertz, with the volume control all the way up, and at 5.2 kilohertz, with the volume control all the way down. Yes, there are other combinations that we could find depending upon the setting of the volume control. But in this test, these are the only two with the, within the extreme limits of the volume control. Well, in the next video, I will be measuring the input complex impedance of my little VHF amplifier. In the meanwhile, if you found this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.